God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, I've changed my message. I was going to go another way tonight, but I've changed my message. Is that okay? Amen. I don't have my overhead tonight. The lady that usually does that is not with us. She's not here. And so I don't have my PowerPoint, and I'm going to be at a loss a little bit because I don't have that. But uh, <clears throat> I'll try to go through it as fast as I can. I'll tell you what, if you will, let me ask you one more time to stand and take your Bibles and turn with me. That's something I usually don't do. I usually have it on the screen for you, but we're going to have to turn to this one tonight. Amen. What did you say? Good old-fashioned way. Come on now. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4 in the King James Version. And I'm going to read verse 9. And I'm going to save a lot of my opening comments to say in my message. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. By the way, how many of you got to come to Brownsville? Can I see your hand, please? Wow, good gracious. There's a lot of you. You got hit good? <laughs> I did too, to tell you the truth. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. It said, Only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, <clears throat> lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. Wow. Tonight, you may be seated. I want to um, just sort of walk my way into your heart, if I may. I talked to a pastor before I came out here and asked him if I could do what I'm going to do. There's a lot of people that look at my ministry as if it's apostolic, and I think probably it is. I don't call myself an apostle by any means, but I do believe my ministry is apostolic. So tonight, I want to speak into the atmosphere. Can I do that? I want to speak into the atmosphere of this church, and I want to speak into your atmosphere. I want to talk about Pentecost. I want to talk about revival. I want to talk about the glory. I believe that the Lord has me on the road going to different churches and preaching different places because I believe the Lord knows that I'll talk about Pentecost to people. <clears throat> you can cut these sleepers down for me just a little bit if you want to. Thank you. And I think that the Lord knows that whenever I talk about Pentecost, I'm trying to help Christians understand it's okay to be Pentecostal. And we don't need to apologize for being Pentecostal. Especially at Evangel Temple in Jacksonville, Florida. Come on now. And I also believe that I need to remind everybody that it's okay to speak in tongues. And it's also still okay to believe in the rapture of the church. And that's who we are and that's what we believe. And people have different beliefs and that's okay. But it's okay for you to be Pentecostal and to lift your hands in worship, to speak in tongues. It's okay to give out messages in tongues in church and interpretation of tongues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the Apostle Paul, or I'm, I'm sorry, Moses was writing in the book of Deuteronomy, and he said, take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things which you, your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But teach them to your children, teach them to your sons and your sons' sons. I have so many stories in my life of what happened at Brownsville and what happened to me in the early years of my life when I was with Pastor and he was my mentor and I was with him every day of my life for my teenage years. I still went to school every day. I was on the DCT program in school. I got out every day at 12.30. I was at school every morning at 7.30. I got out at 12.30 and I was what they call pastors. I did work for pastors, what I did. He paid me. And so it was a job, and I was with him every day, and I was with him all day after I got out of school, and then we'd come back that night, we'd pray. And um, he was my mentor, but he's also like my father because my father abandoned my mother and I whenever I was 12. 
So I had some experiences that I experienced with pastor. He was not my biological father, but he was my spiritual father. And I thank God every day for him. He taught me to pray. He taught me about the Lord. He taught me about the love for Pentecost. He taught me everything I know. I went to Bible college, and by the time I got there, I don't say this braggadociously, but by the time I got to Bible college, I already knew most of the things they taught me because he taught them to me. <clears throat> but I had some experiences. One experience, and, and what I'm going to do tonight, I'm not going to necessarily so much preach to you as I am. I just want to talk to you for a little bit. just want to speak into this atmosphere. I remember... <clears throat> Early in my life, it seemed like that for some reason, God would permit the error to come in my life before the truth. I would usually have error before I'd have truth. We prayed, and we prayed every night for years, and I never missed one night, seven nights a week, after church on Wednesday, after church on Sunday, we'd still come back every night. We had called the midnight prayer meetings. Pastor would lay on the floor, in the dark, and some nights there would be 20 men there, some nights there'd be eight or 10 there, many nights it was just me and him, many nights, most nights, just me and him. And at 11.30, he would take his coat off, he'd roll up his long sleeve white shirt, he'd put his hand under his head, and he'd lay there and tell preacher stories. And he would tell us what God did for him in the early years of his Bush, Brush Harbor meetings in Illinois, Missouri, places like that. And he'd tell stories about how God healed people. He'd tell stories about how people were filled with the Holy Spirit. He'd tell people about how he'd get off the train and they would have a Brush Harbor way out in the middle of nowhere. When he got off the train, he knew how many steps to count as he walked down the railroad track before he took a lift. And there was a dirt road there and there'd be a brush harbor down there with kerosene lights and they would have church until the wee hours of the morning and God would do great and powerful miracles. And he would tell stories. He'd tell stories about healings. He'd tell stories about miracles and he'd just tell all kinds of things and boy, my heart would just burn as I'd lay there on the floor and listen to these stories. But I remember one night in particular, we had a powerful prayer meeting. I came home, went to bed, went to sleep and I had to get up early in the morning because I had to be at school at 7.30. I usually wouldn't get home at, at least till 1.30 or two o'clock in the morning. And so I woke up early that morning. Mother was in the kitchen cooking breakfast for me. And I could hear her in there humming while she's in there cooking my breakfast. And I had, we had an attic fan in those days. And so there was a shoe inside the attic, fan, uh, inside the door, because the attic fan would, you know, we had the windows raised and the attic fan was pulling air in the house and you could see those, wind, those curtains standing out, you know. And so it was good sleeping, man. It was cool, good sleeping, fresh air. So I was laying there in the bed, had the shoe in the door, and I could hear mother in there humming and all of a sudden the door to my bedroom opened up and I'm telling you, it was a dead ringer for Jesus Christ. It was a dead ringer. I'm talking about the robe, the sandals, the look. He walked in my bedroom, opened the door, walked in my bedroom, stood at the foot of my bed, and everything in me wanted to fall out of that bed and grab him around the feet and say, Jesus, Jesus. But I had a, I had an annoying question something just didn't feel right. And I heard the Lord say to me in my spirit, where's his nail scars? And I looked and there was no nail scars in his hand, no nail scars in his feet. And I leaned up on my left elbow like this in the bed and I pointed my finger at him and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you and I command you, leave this room. And he, he burst just like a bubble. He just burst and left, just like a bubble. It so shocked me that I could have that kind of experience. It was a false experience. I was 14, 15, I was probably 15, maybe even 16 by then. I think I was 16 by then. I was a teenager. I'm praying with pastor every night. And while we're praying every night, we're having some powerful prayer meetings, of course. 
But this is an experience I had, and the first experience I had was a fake experience. And when I leaned up and I said, I bind you in Jesus' name, I bind you, leave this room. And he just burst like a bubble. And I could not believe what happened. I told mother, I called pastor, I told pastor about it. It affected me, of course, more than it did them because I'm the one that saw it. It looked so real. But let me tell you what happened. Shortly after that, I'm down at the church fasting and praying. I'm upstairs in the Sunday school room in the daytime after I got out of school. And while I'm in the upstairs Sunday school room praying, opened the door, someone opened the door and I looked and it was the Lord. And he had behind him like little spoons like you cook with that you roll out like that, you know? Little spoons, he just rolled them out like that. And he held those spoons up right before me and he said, you can have as much of me as you want. The choice is yours. And he walked out of the room. He didn't disappear. It was not an apparition. It was really the Lord. I had the fake before I had the real. And I want you to understand something. We're living in a time right now where the fake is rampant on every hand. But I want to encourage you Hold on to God, have some experiences that happens in this church, have some stories to tell your children and your children's children, and be sure to share with them what God is doing at Evangel down through the years, not only now, but down through the years. And one of the things I sat there today at dinner and I heard them talking about Brother Jordan's wife. She used to be part of a church that I'd preach at in New Jersey a lot, Pastor Demola's church. And they said that they came down here and they were part of Brother Demola's church and they had a powerful church up there, Pentecostal church. It was seated about 5,000 people. It was a big church for New Jersey. And she said they came down here and she saw that, um, that Pastor Gary was running back and forth across the platform and it caught their attention because that's what the Pastor Demola did up in New Jersey. And they started coming to this church because they saw him running up and down the platform. They, they knew that the power of God was in this place. The power of God draws people. I want to tell you the power of God does not repel people. The power of God does not turn people off. The power of God draws people. Believe me, we're living in a time today where people want signs and wonders and miracles. They don't want the counterfeit, but they do want the real. And the Bible says about Saul, Saul had a power encounter. The first person of the early church. The scripture tells us that he was on the way to Damascus to persecute the Christians. And he met the Lord. And the Lord appeared to him brighter than the noonday sun. And the Lord asked him, why are you persecuting my people? Why? And Saul gave in right there and he called Jesus. He called him by name. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? He was a man that was hard. He was a Pharisee. He was deceived. He was killing people. He was taking parents away from kids and making them work in the salt mines the rest of their life. He was an ungodly religious bigot. But when he had a confrontation with Christ, he had a power encounter and it changed his life. You know what I believe? I believe that there's people today that's leading this nation that I believe in the near future God's gonna give them a power encounter and they're gonna change and I believe they're gonna be instrumental in help bring revival to America. You say, I don't believe that. I do believe that. If God can do it with Saul, he can do it with them. Don't limit a limitless God. Somebody shout amen. And the Bible says that when Saul had that encounter with the Lord, something happened. It reversed his concept of right and wrong. His hopes and dreams changed instantly. His hates and loves and desires changed instantly. He turned his back on all that he had spent his life to attain. He spent the rest of his life roaming around the Roman Empire preaching about the one he persecuted so ruthlessly and his church. And he had a born again experience. He had a power encounter. 
Oh my God. Oh Lord, please send the atmosphere in America, even in Washington, D.C., and even in the major cities in our world that's having such upheaval. God, send such a wave of revival that people will have power encounters that will change their life and in turn change America. That's the only thing that will turn America around. How many of you understand it will not be a Democrat that will do it, it will not be a Republican, it will be the power of the Holy Spirit. In early Pentecost, God manifested himself in early Pentecost without reservation and without restriction. It was enough to draw people. In early Pentecost, when God first poured out his spirit in this nation, altar calls were simple. They were matter of fact. They were to the point. There was no psychological games. Holy Ghost conviction drove lost souls to the altars where they were saved and where they repented and where they were changed. And it was not some kind of a fake change. It was real change. They had a power encounter that turned their life upside down. They were genuinely saved. They were translated from darkness into God's glorious light. Nothing else mattered to these people in early Pentecost. In America, the love of pleasure ceased. The love of the world ceased. A newfound fervor captured their hearts. It was a love for God and a love for his word. Some had power encounters that defied explanation in early Pentecost in America. Some were slain by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praises and worship transcended the earthly and invaded the heavenly. Physical laws were bent like putty. Sickness and disease were instantly healed. Others could no longer speak in English or their native language. They began to speak with new tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. No one ever knew what was going to happen next in early Pentecost. There was no liturgy. There was no schedule. There was nothing but just a divine spontaneity of the Holy Ghost. These types of experiences were kinds of things that set Pentecostals apart in early America and made them radical. They were known as the radical bunch of Christianity. They had a collective purpose to introduce the world to Jesus as he really is. He's real, he's powerful, and he's almighty. And they wanted everyone, the dead ecclesiastical church of the hour, in a lost and dying world, they wanted them to know that there was a God anxious to intervene in the lives of mankind. And in the opening days of the 20th century, there were glorious days for Pentecostals. The flame of the fire of the Holy Ghost revival blazed hot to a cold and a dying world. The world saw real, true power of God. It wasn't fake, it wasn't hope so, it wasn't maybe so, it was real. Although they did great and powerful things by making God known, they made one blunder. And it was the blunder that I read to you a while ago out of Deuteronomy. The Bible says they failed to make known the power encounter with a living and an all-powerful God to their children and their children's children. It was a breakdown of communication from those that had experienced God and their children who had not yet experienced God. The first generation of Pentecostal prayed. They had to pray. They were the pioneers. They prayed, they sought God, they tarried, they fasted. They waited on God sometime for days, left their crops in the field and fasted and prayed and tarried and waited before God until God would send his power and touch them. They sought God with all of their might they had a ravenous hunger to know God and to experience God and to experience his power. They knew that prayer brought subsequent power encounters. They knew that it was all based and predicated on prayer and they were praying people. Their children, however, did not have that same motivation to pray. 
like their parents because they grew up in a warm Christian home under Bible morality. Dad didn't drink, mom didn't drink. Dad didn't carouse, mom didn't carouse. Children grew up in a Christian home. Dad and mom had to pay the price, but many of the children did not really know the price that their mom and dad paid. They just inherited that atmosphere and they inherited that reality. They did not have the motivation to pray like their parents did because their parents had to have it and they had to pay the price to get it. So they experienced God's grace, but they did not really experience God's power. And the first generation experienced it because it was required to change their lives. But because their children was already under a godly moral atmosphere, they didn't need so much the change as their parents did. The second generation Christians accepted Christ, but that was about it. They didn't hunger after God to have an experience like their mother and dad did. And since the frequency and intensity of remarkable signs and wonders only come because of prayer, there was not that many signs and wonders that the second generation saw that the first generation experienced. They did not know the rich value of prayer and they did not know the rich heritage of a Pentecostal heritage. They were inheritors. They respected their parents' power encounters, but they didn't fight for their own and pursue one for themselves. So I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible says that Abraham was 90 years old and nine, he was 99, and the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty, walk before me and be perfect, and I will make a covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, my covenant is with you, Abraham, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And Abraham was an idol worshiper. He was a heathen. And God appeared unto him because God saw some metal in Abram that he liked. He knew that he was dependable. He knew that he had character, and he knew that he was a man of his word. And God appeared to him and said, I want you. I want you in my life, and I want you to be the progenitor of a race that I'm going to establish called the Hebrews, the Jewish race, and I want to use you. And Abraham represented that first generation where God began to do something new. He was a pioneer embarking on a spiritual journey. No recent precedent for what Abraham set out to do. There was a characteristic about him that the Bible lists. He had several characteristics, but two of them I wanna talk about. One, he was an altar builder. Abraham was an altar builder. He couldn't make it through a chapter hardly without building an altar. He was handy with a saw. He was handy with his hands. It wasn't an architectural zeal that consumed Abraham. It was a spiritual hallmark that he wanted to build something beautiful. And he wanted to build that altar because he's moving down this journey. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And God has him on a journey and he's building these altars and he's leaving them behind as a hallmark of the experience that Abraham had with God. And when people would come to those altars and see those altars and experience God at those altars like Abraham did, those altars stood for prayer and they stood for relationship. There was something special that he found in God that consumed him to memorialize to everybody that came behind him what God meant to him by building that altar. The Bible said he built an altar and it was on the east side, it was a place called Bethel and on the west it was high on the east and he built an altar to the Lord and called, the name, called upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 13 says, he removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built an altar in Hebron to the Lord. 22 of Genesis said, 
they came to a place which God told him of, and Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, upon the altar of that wood. Abraham possessed the spirit of a prayer warrior. Abraham was, he was destined, he was committed to having a relationship with God. There was an urgency about him. He was on the offensive. I've got to know God. He was a blazing trailblazer. Not only was he an altar builder, but he had another trait. He was a well digger. And the Bible says it was not his love for construction that he, di- that he built wells, dug wells, but it was a desire to bless others that were coming behind him. Back in those days, there was no television, there was no radio, there was no printed press. When Abraham would dig a well and he had an experience with God in a location, and God would touch Abraham and God would speak to Abraham and God would say, my name is Jehovah Jireh. My name is, my name is Jehovah Rapha or my name is Jehovah or my name is this, that, and the other. He would go off quickly and he would dig down until he would hit water. He would build a well, a, he'd build a, 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 a well and then he would build a casing around that well and he would put over the name of that well, the name of that well, which was what he experienced God. In other words, the experience that he had with God is what he would name the well. And when people would come by and see the well that Abraham had dug, they would see the name of God and God revealed himself through his name. And as they would come upon the name of that well, they would drink the water out of it and they too would begin to ask God for a relationship that they could have with God. Are you following what I'm trying to get at tonight? So the first generation Like Abraham, they were altar builders, they were well diggers, they had to pay the price, they had to eke it out, they were pioneers. Nobody else blazed a trail before them. Abraham was the first. But then after Abraham, and he was the altar builder and a well digger, and he was telling people about all these experiences and about how God revealed himself to him, and he was passing those names along to the public. Now comes Isaac, Abraham's dead. Now comes Isaac. Isaac was an inheritor. Things were easy for Isaac. His name means laughter. He didn't have to pay the same price that his dad paid. And so his name was laughter and his name was Isaac and he was the second generation. What prayer was to his father Prayer did not mean the same thing to Isaac. What I see happening in so many places, and it's not that way here, thank God. I want to just say to this church, you need to thank God that you have a third generation in this church of a Wiggins that knows what the power of God and the presence of God is all about. Come on, give God a good hand clap. Come on, everybody. Yeah. Isaac didn't have to pay a price and he was an inheritor. He just inherited the blessings. And they came upon him and the Bible says in the second generation, Isaac moved into that blessing freely. And what self-denial and self-sacrifice was to his daddy, Isaac didn't see it the same way. He wasn't an altar builder, he wasn't a well digger. And there was prayerlessness in his life. And the Bible says, Isaac's servants dig wells in the valley and they found their wells of living, they found their wells of springing up water. And the herdsmen of Gerar strove with Isaac's herdsmen and they said, the water is ours. And he called the name of the place Isaac because they strove together at that well. Isaac was not digging the wells. His His father dug the wells. Isaac was letting others dig his own wells. Could I say something to you, ladies and gentlemen? We cannot let the past generations dig our wells for us. The time has come. We've got to dig our own wells. We've got to have our own experience, and we've got to have our own Pentecost. We cannot inherit it for somebody else. And the Bible said he digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, 
because the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names which his father called them. And the blessings began to flow now that he went back and redug the wells of his father. The blessings began to flow. He went back and redug the wells of Abraham. Today, there's churches that do not want to do that. They don't want to go back and rig the wells of Pentecost. Today, we must not assume that our descendants are going to automatically feel about Pentecost the way we feel about Pentecost. Today, I want to say this, and I want to say it in this atmosphere, and I want you to listen to me carefully. Today, we must not assume that our descendants will feel about sin like we felt about sin. Today, you cannot assume that your children are going to feel about certain abominations listed in the Bible of how early Pentecostals felt about it. And there's more of a leniency. And there's more of a tolerance. I'm okay, you're okay. And I wanna just tell you tonight, as a servant of the Most High God, if that ever creeps into Evangel Temple, in Jacksonville, Florida, you can kiss the anointing goodbye. You have to have convictions and you have to stand upon those convictions if you're gonna have the anointing and the moving of the presence of God. Somebody shout amen. amen. By the time it came to Jacob, Jacob was the third generation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the time it came to Jacob, oh my God, what was a must for Abraham was a convenience for Isaac and it was nonsense for Jacob. By the time Jacob came along, it was nonsense. What? Well digging, are you serious? What? Altar building? Naming it, name, what are you, are you, I, no, no. By the time the third generation comes, what was so important to the first generation by the time the third generation comes, it's nonsense. Speaking in tongues is nonsense to those people. Right. Having altar calls is nonsense to the third generation. To the third generation of Pentecostals many times, they don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in tongues and interpretation of tongues. They don't believe in divine healing. They don't believe in casting out demons. They don't believe in letting the power of the Holy Spirit move. I just want to stand here tonight and speak into this atmosphere and I just want to remind everybody, we are Pentecostals. There's been people before us that paid the price. Let us not trample on what they have done and the blood, sweat, and tears that they have laid down. Let us remember we are Pentecostals and we've got to treasure that. And don't forget to tell your children and your children's children. But I got good news for you. The Bible says that Jacob went to Uncle Laban's house. You remember Uncle Laban? How many of you knows if you're a rascal and a deceiver, Uncle Laban is a bigger rascal than you are? How many of you knows if you're a deceiver, God's always got somebody he can put you under that can cut you down to size real quick. And God took Jacob and sent him to Uncle Laban's house. And by the time he got to Uncle Laban's house and spent some time there with him, he began to pull some of those shenanigans on Laban and Laban began to pull some shenanigans on him until finally one day Jacob said, I've got to go. I've got to take my wife and kids and I've got to go. I can't tarry here with you any longer. And you remember how he stole the birthright from his brother Esau? But the Bible says after he left Uncle Laban, he sent his wife and kids on ahead and Jacob lingered back and Jacob was alone and the Lord came and visited Jacob. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a wonderful day when God comes to visit the rascals that once knew the power of God but they don't care about it anymore. I don't believe God's gonna leave these people alone. I believe God's gonna come back to them and revisit them again and show them that he is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. And the Bible says Isaac was, or Jacob was left alone. 
and he wrestled with the Lord. And finally, right before morning, the Lord hit him in the hip, in the hollow part of his hip, and knocked his hip out of joint. And whenever he finally had to face his brother Esau later that day, he went hobbling to him. He had that hip knocked out of joint, and by the time Esau saw Jacob hobbling toward him, his bowels of compassion was turned loose. But you see, Jacob had an experience with God. Let me tell you what happens when people have an experience with God. Jacob went back and did what his grandfather Abraham did and what his daddy Isaac did. He built wells. How do I know? When Jesus was here, the Bible said he met the woman at Jacob's well. Remember? He met the woman at Jacob's well. And that's where he told her all that she was all about. I know who you are, and I know that the one that you're living with is not your husband. I know all about you. And the Bible said that she left Jesus at the well, and she went into the city, and she said, come and see a man. <laughs> come and see a man that told me all about myself. You know, what I'm trying to say is this. Sometimes those that think that the power of God is, is just nonsense and they think, well, you know, speaking in tongues and all the things that make Pentecostals Pentecostals is nonsense. In the days ahead, there's gonna be such difficult days. People's gonna have power encounters with God and they're gonna make some of the best evangelists and some of the best apostles and prophets and evangelists that you've ever heard. God is gonna touch them and change their life. Somebody shout amen tonight. Woo, man, I feel that. Stand up just a minute. Let's lift our hands and praise God. I'm not through, but come on, lift your voice. Come on, lift your voice, church. Woo! Man, I don't know about you, but I feel the power of the Holy Spirit in here. I can see it out there on you right now. Matter of fact, let's just find a prayer partner right quick and pray for one another. Would you do that? Ladies with ladies and men with men. Come on, let's find a prayer partner right quick. I need a little bit of keyboard music up here if I will, please. If you'll give me a little bit of key, uh, keyboard music, come on. Sharamu horanda bayan raba sanamayano. Bita koraba satam bayando. Kutar u marabayanda la bayante. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, find a prayer partner. Lay hands on one another. Begin to pray for one another. Come on, church. Let God touch you right where you are. Come on. Woo! Come on, Rabba Satander Bayando. Man, I feel the presence of the Lord in this house. Come on, church. Come on. Get a hold of God. Lay your hands on one another. Let's do it. I need a fresh wind, a 
fragrance of heaven pour your spirit out yeah. pour your spirit out yeah. holy anointing yes, Lord. the power of your presence yes, Lord. pour your spirit out
Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come on, come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house, is a house of miracles. Miracles yes, are everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come on, let's prophesy. See, come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive.
of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Come on, just your voices, sing it out. Begin to sing out your own song to him tonight. pastoral staff come on stage and I want you to stretch your hands out towards the spiritual leadership of this house. Pastor John Kilpatrick is going to lay hands on all of them 
And as the ministers and the spiritual leaders, they carry a weight, they carry a burden. And we need the presence of God for the season that we are in, amen? And I'm thankful that his presence provides us with everything that we need. So this represents the spiritual leadership, the pastors, the pastoral staff. And so Jen, come on in, please. All of our ministers, I want you to just stretch your hands out. Just begin to intercede. Begin to pray over. Begin to speak blessing and life over each and every person that God has hope. He has plans. He has destiny over each and every one. As they fight it out in the day-to-day, as they fight it out in the spiritual, I want you to pray that God would refresh. He would reveal. Place fresh vision. Vision fresh dreams in the name of Jesus, fresh encounters, fresh fire in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Just begin to intercede. Begin to speak it. Begin to decree it and declare it over each and every one. That as they contend for this house, are we willing to contend for them in Jesus' name? They contend day in and day out. They pray day in and day out. And I want us to speak life and speak destiny and hope over every 